from Animalia by Jean-Baptiste Delamo, published by Fitzcarraldo in the UK and by Grove Press in the States. It's the story of a simple farm in the early 1900s that moves on through the century. This from the early section is how a pig would have been slaughtered on a small farm at the time. Each year, a few days before All Saints' Day, the animal is slaughtered. In the early morning, there's a great commotion. Mother and daughter, joined by women from the neighbouring farms, old Mother Fabre and her daughter-in-law, Madame Coque, and her brood of children set to boiling large quantities of water and ready the basins in a large barrel of tarred wooden staves. Brisa, summoned for the occasion, sharpens the blade of a knife on an oiled whetstone. With a new lease of life, the father demands that they get him up and dress him, and the protestations of the genitrix do not succeed in dissuading him. The shirt they dress him in is baggy now. The trousers are held up by twine threaded through the belt loops. Like a tattered, jerky puppet, he manages to walk with Valiner's hand supporting his elbow. Once on the doorstep, he stands for a long moment without moving, his face bathing in the cold sunlight. He breathes deeply, inhaling the comforting smells of the manure heap, of the dead leaves beginning their slow decomposition beneath the black bare trees that ring the farm, and his daughter feels the life-giving shudder that courses through his body. Dragging his feet, he reaches the little worm-eaten hobnailed bench that is warped seat and sits on it one last time, while the genitrix drapes two thick blankets and his cloak over his shoulders. You can't say I didn't warn you, she says. Father does not seem to hear her and turns towards Alphonse, who comes over to sniff him, reaches out a hand to stroke the greying head, but the dog scurries away, tail between his legs, under the misted eyes of the father. Soon shrieks can be heard from the sky. Alphonse stands in the middle of the yard, barking, and Brizard gets to his feet, running the sharpened blade of the knife against the pad of his thumb, leaving a shallow gash in the hard skin. Marcel suddenly appears, dragging behind him into the daylight and using every ounce of his strength, the pig he has hogtied and muzzled with a length of rope. He drags the still struggling animal on its side as a long guttural squeal comes from its snout in a spray of white spittle. The mother brings over a basin and, in the instant when the sticker approaches and the sun reflected on the knife's blade casts a fleeting flicker onto Marcel's face, the pig surrenders, freezes in the vice of hands restraining it, its eye fixes the blue of the sky streaked with wisps of low fog. Its breath condenses. Its bladder empties onto its hind hocks. From the bench, the father approvingly gauges the size of the pig. Albert Brizard plunges the blade into the throat up to the hilt, severs the artery in a trice, withdraws the spotless blade as the animal's heart pulses, fitful spurts of blood into the bucket pressed to the lips of the wound and the stern face of the genitrix and the top of her white blouse are spotted with a fine mist that splashes from the bucket. Eleanor slips between the adults and lays a hand on the animal's back as its breathing diminishes and dies. When the genitrix straightens up and hands the bucket to the neighbours who carry it away, she does not bother to wipe away the drops caught in her eyebrows and the downy hair of her cheeks. The men grab the now pliable carcass and lift it up so that the last of the fluid can drain out. They lift it into the vat, and the women bring pans of boiling water from the kitchen and pour it over the remains, creating great clouds of steam that force them to retreat, making little cries. Then the men, armed with knives and razors, roughly scrape the scalded skin. And soon the bristles are floating on the surface of the turbid, stinking water, clinging to their skin around their wrists. Then they hoist the gleaming pig onto a ladder, spread its limbs and lash them to the rungs. Brizard buries the knife in the wound he has already made, and he cuts. Cuts away the neck muscle until he sees the trachea, which he cuts from the discs of the cervical vertebrae, which he separates to reveal a corolla of red marrow. There is a clamour of voices, and the farmyard is filled with the cries of children who, already bored by the spectacle, run and scatter like chickens. The pig's trotters are also cut off, the cartilage is broken, the bones disarticulated, the abdomen is sliced open and the mass of entrails exhaling soft tendrils of steam is deftly detached by Brizard, working his knife blade in a patient sawing motion, plunging his hands deeper to support the intestinal circumvolutions. 
He excises the anus, separates the pinkish mass of the lungs, sections the nerves, and finally pulls out the sagging, stinking load and lets it drop into a tub which the women take away. Now sitting next to the father, Eleanor stares at the genetrix, astonishingly genial, surrounded by women, smiling. The women are armed with little blades, their hands smeared with bile and excrement as they cut and squeeze the innards, which they rinse thoroughly, then roll out in front of them in long, translucent ribbons. The enucleated pig's head is boiled and then picked clean with every morsel of meat to make pâté. The trotters are also boiled with herbs and spices. The ham hocks are salted and hung from the rafters to dry. The melted fat is decanted into jars. The children nibble on little pieces of fried pork rinds that crunch between their teeth. Their faces and hands are glossy with lard. The farm is fragrant with the smells of excrement, acrid smoke, metal and cooking. A few hours later, Sitting at the table, they gorge themselves on hot blood sausage and offal simmered in the sauce of wine and blood, which they sop up with large hunks of bread, and which even the father eats hungrily. That night, Eleanor dreams of a cliff towering above the Sea of Galilee, from which thousands of pigs are hurling themselves, and then of black water, where thousands of their floating carcasses drift towards bottomless abysses.